In this lecture segment, we're gonna talk about um, polyprotic acids um, and base chemical equilibrium. Now, in the last lecture, we talked about monoprotic acids, and as the word suggests, mono means only one ionizable proton, you know, is being uh, dissociated. With polyprotic acids, you know, you've got more than one ionizable hydrogen. For diprotics, you've got two. For triprotics, you've got three, and so on. Now, there are many examples of polyprotic acids and bases, you know, in, uh, in, in the environment and in nature. <clears throat> For example, you're going to find, you know, most of the amino acids, you know, the 23 amino acids, um, you know, that make up different types of peptides and proteins. All of them, you know, you're going to find they've got an amino group you know, which can be protonated, you know, meaning as an acid, but they also have, you know, the carboxylic acid group, okay, and so in that case then, you know, is a, at least a diprotic acid. A good example is glycine, and glycine is uh, the, the smallest sort of molecular weight amino acid that makes up different types of proteins, and you can see that it's got, you know, a hydrolyzable proton but also you know if it's protonated in this form then it's a diprotic acid you can lose one um, hydronium ion and the pKa1 is as such yeah 2.35 and also you know you can lose um, an hydrogen you know from the protonated amine group and the pKa2 is equals to around 9.78 you know to get you know the fully deprotonated base but other than amino acids you also have other types of uh, polyprotic acids a good example is sulfuric acid a mineral acid and it's got you know two hydrolyzable proteins also a good example is vinegar acetic acid again it's got you know two hydrolyzable hydrogens Got something like oxalic acid, you know, another very common types of type of diprotic acid. If you get a bee's um, or a wasp sting, you know, often you know you get that sting, <laughs> that that feeling of a sting because of the oxalic acid, you know, that is emitted by different types of ants. And again, you know, it's got two protonatable, you know, uh, hydrogens. And so there are many different types of polyprotic, you know, acids and bases, you know, in nature. And like I've said, you know, amino acids are classical examples. <clears throat> so let me use an amino acid, you know, glycine as an example, you know, to take you through the different ways you treat a polyprotic uh, acid base equilibrium system now you, you've got glycine um you, you you got glycine right there as i've said you know it's got two hydrolyzable you know protons meaning it, it can undergo one hydrolysis you know to give you an ampiprotic species you know plus a hydronium ion now these ampiprotic species can further undergo hydrolysis you know the ka2 to give you, you know, the uh, deprotonated base, you know, and an hydronium ion. <clears throat> and of course, you can set up, you know, the equilibrium expression as follows, you know, the products, concentrations, you know, divided by the reactant. And similarly, you can do the same, you know, for the second um, uh, hydrolysis, you know, or other dissociation reaction. But remember, each one of these, you know, the bases here can further undergo uh, hydrolysis. For example, the deprotonated base, you know, can react with water, capture a hydrogen, and that way you get the ampiprotic species, the Hg, and then you get, you know, the OH, and that's what you call the Kb, um, the, the Kb1. Um, one in this case is so a hydrolysis you know type of reaction and the corresponding you know hydrolysis expression is as such you know the products divided of course you know by the reactant 
This is a G again, can undergo further hydrolysis, you know, the KB2, you know, to give you back the fully deprotonate, the fully protonated um, glycine and a hydroxide, and the corresponding, you know, equilibrium expression, you know, is as a such. And so you're going to find if you take reaction one and combine it with reaction two, you know, you can find, you know, these guys cancels out. And what you're going to be left actually with, it's water, you know, giving you the hydronium ion and the hyd um, hydroxide. And so it gives you essentially the KW. So if you combine reaction one and two, you get this kind of expression, the, the autoprotolysis, you know, constant. The KW is equals to the KA1 you know, multiplied, you know, by the KB2. On the other hand, if you combine these two reactions, as you can see, you know, the HG cancels out, you know, the G minus cancels out. And so what you have left, you know, it's water giving you H plus, you know, and OH minus. And again, you get this kind of um, expression, autoprotolysis, you know, constant where the KW is equal to, you know, the KA2 multiplied by the KB1, the KB1. So hopefully that's very clear, okay? You know, so the KW is equal to the KA1 multiplied by the KB2, and that is, of course, the base um, constant, um, the, 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 uh, the, the base constant, the KB2, and so forth. And of course, there are many different types of acids, uh, amino acids, 23 of them. Most often, you know, they are diprotic acids, such as alanine. You can see it's got a pKa1 and the pKa2, okay? And of course, that is a carboxylic acid, you know, that is giving up uh, the hydronium ion. And then the ammonium, you know, is a much weaker acid, and that's why it's Ka2, you know, is fairly small. But you also have some amino acids, you know, which have got up to three hydrolyzable, you know, protons. And in that case, you know, they are triprotic acids, you know, something like this, you know. They are triprotic acids, you know, something like arginine, you can see is a triprotic acid. Something like aspartic acid, you know, again, you can see is a triprotic acid. Something like histidine, you know. It's an aromatic, you know, type of an amino acid, very common. You know, again, you can see, you know, it's got a Ka1, a Ka2, and a Ka3, meaning it's a triprotic acid, you know, and so forth. And there are the amino acids, you know, like tryptophan. Again, you can see it's a very common type of amino acid, you know, present in milk. And you can see again the Ka1, which um, involves the carboxylic acid, you know, dissociating, is the most, is the strongest of the uh, functional group, you know, that is acidic, is 2.4. And then the ammonium group, again, it's an acid, you know, it gives you 9.3, and that's a pKa2. So again, you can see the diprotic acid. Tyrosine, you know, on the other hand, and tyrosine, really, it's what gives um, it, it, it's a building block, you know, of melanin, the pigmentation on the skin. And you can see that one, it's got, you know, it's a triprotic acid, meaning it's got three hydrolyzable proteins. So, so you can see the importance of polyprotic acids as building blocks, you know, of peptides as building blocks of proteins. And of course, you know, proteins is what you know, really makes up, you know, tissues and life in general. So, so in this lecture, what I like you really to focus on, or like I like us to focus on, is how do you calculate the pH of polyprotic acids and bases? Now, I'll give you an example. Assume you've got a diprotic acid, you know, such as glycine hydrogen chloride, you know, which is here. And I make a solution of 0 0.05 uh, glycine, um, you know, hydrogen chloride. As you can see, you know, the chloride dissociates completely, so it's not very important in this case. You know, and what we are left with, you know, is a glycine, which is a dihydrogen 
glycine, you know, meaning it's got two hydrolyzable, you know, proteins. How do I get the pH, you know, from this solution of, you know, 0 0.05 molar, 0 0.05 molar of H2G, you know, which is the glycine, okay? Now, the way you do it is, of course, there are many reactions taking place, one of which is, you know, the H2G plus, of course, we know, is gonna hydrolyze Ka1, you know, to Hg, you know, plus uh, the H plus, the hydronium ion. But I also know whatever I form here, you know, can hydrolyze further the Ka2 to give me the G2 minus plus, you know, the hydronium ion. So I've got those two equilibrium expressions here that are going to result, you know, out of the glycine hydrolyzing. Take note of this. If you look at the magnitude of the Ka1, you know, it means that this reaction um, is much more prevalent, you know, than the second reaction. Because you can see the second reaction is about uh, seven orders of magnitude less compared, you know, to this. So in fact, when you're calculating the pH, you can essentially neglect, you know, the effect, you know, of the second dissociation and simply treat, you know, these diprotic acid simply as a monoprotic acid. I hope that's clear. Okay, meaning is, is a regular monoprotic acid, meaning is a predominantly, you know, um, only the first reaction is taking place. And of course, we know, you know, for monoprotic acids, you know, um, I, I get it hydrolyzing as follows, you know, it's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, meaning I get X forming for the hydronium ion and X forming, you know, for the ampiprotic species. And so the KA1 really is equals to what you have here, you know, which is X multiplied by the X because of the one-to-one -one stoichiometry divided by the formal concentration, you know, minus x, you know, which is what I have here. Now, in most cases, you don't really need to solve a quadratic equation because you make an assumption, you, you make an assumption that f minus x really is equals to f, and for f refers to the formal concentration, you know, which is equals to 0 0.0500 molar concentration. Okay, but of course we are making this assumption by saying that the 5% rule or the, the percent dissociation is not that significant. Okay, and what you get here is a pH of 1.889. Okay, if the 5% rule doesn't hold true, and in this case I'm confident it will not hold true, then you have to solve the quadratic you know, equation, uh, which is, again, fairly straightforward using the quadratic formula, you know, which is shown here. I hope it's clearly clear. So that is if you're calculating the concentration of A, which is 0 0.05 molar of glycine hydrochloride. That's what I made in the lab, and I wanted to get the pH of that solution. So again, I treat it, you know, like a simple monoprotic acid uh, dissociation because I'm neglecting, you know, the second dissociation because you can see the Ka2 is very, very small compared to the Ka1. Now, what if on the other hand, you know, I had the mono hydrogen glycine you know that i got from the shell when i made this solution what would be the ph in that case now remember this is an ampiprotic species you know meaning it can undergo dissociation so it can behave as an acid and you can see this is a ka2 but also it can undergo hydrolysis you know meaning um this is the kb uh, the KB2, the KB2, meaning it can undergo hydrolysis, okay? Now, we already know that um, 
is an amphiprotic species. If at all you've been given the Ka2, but you've not been given the Kb2, remember you can calculate, you know, the Kb2, <clears throat> you know, from, you know, the Kw divided by the Ka1. Because remember what we said, you know, the Kw is equals to the Kb2 multiplied by the Ka1, sorry, the Ka1, which I already showed you, you know, in the previous slide. So if already you've been given the Ka1 and the Ka2, you can calculate, you know, the Kb2 and the Kb1. Remember the Kw also is equals to the Kb1 multiplied by the Ka2. So if you know this, you know, you can calculate, you know, this one as well, okay? So the key thing is the following. Take note of this. This is an amphiprotic species. So how do you determine the pH of an amphiprotic species? You derive an equation based on the charge balance, okay? And it can look fairly ugly, and I won't take you through all the derivations. In fact, I don't expect you to really know all these derivations, although you can take a look at it just for your uh, understanding. But if you use a charge balance, you know, um, manipulation, you end up with this equation, you know, that the hydronium ion is equal to the root of the Ka1, the Ka2, the concentration of the amphiprotic species, you know, plus the Ka1, the Kw, you know, divided, you know, by that ratio. So essentially, if I have a an amphiprotic species, you know, that is a diprotic, uh, um, is a diprotic species, okay, then what I just need to do is invoke this equation to calculate the concentration of the hydronium ion. So it's as simple as that, okay. Meaning, in this case, I will just substitute this here, that's a concentration of the Hg, the Ka1 and the Ka2 are fairly known. All these are constant. And I can substitute them into that equation and get a pH, you know, of 6.0A2. Remember the Ka1, Ka2, Kw, all of them are constants, you know, that you'll be given. Take note of this, that you can even simplify this equation further, okay? If you have an amphiprotic species, it tends to be concentration independent, okay? Meaning I can cancel out, you know, these concentrations, all right? And what I'm going to be left with, you know, is this relationship, that the pH is equal to the pKa1 plus the pKa2 divided by 2. Because if you look at this, the Ka1, Kw is very, very small, so I can neglect that. I can neglect that, you know, I can neglect, you know, that as well. And, and eventually, you know, I'll be left with this relationship. The pKa1 is equals to, um, pH is equals to the pKa1 plus the pKa2, you know, divided, you know, by, divided by 2. Okay. And, and so, essentially, you're going to see if I, invoke this relationship and neglect you know the Hg you're gonna see that I get a pH of 6.06 .06, which is very similar to what I had here when I invoked or when I used the concentration so essentially what I'm saying is a concentration you know of amphiprotic species you know doesn't contribute significantly to the concentration of the hydronium ion or to the pH, and so it can be neglected, okay? So if I tell you have an amphiprotic species, that's the way you calculate, you know, the pH. So the other last example is how do you calculate the concentration now of a completely conjugate base, you know? So remember I had, you know, the Hg as an amphiprotic species on the other side, on the other slide. You know, the Ka, um, the Ka2 gave me now the, gave me now the glycine, you know, that doesn't have any hydrolyzable protein. 
and now this is you know what you refer to as you know a conjugate um a conjugate base all right so it's a conjugate base so when you're dealing with a conjugate base just like you know a when we are dealing with a conjugate with a conjugate acid we assume that it's a monoprotic acid meaning the predominant reaction taking place is this you know the the the, the, the glycine reacting with water you know to give you that's a keb1 to give you the hg plus you know the oh minus and you can see the kb1 is very significant all right you know it's 10 to power minus 5 compared to the kb2 you know which is 10 to power minus 12 and so essentially you can neglect you know the second you know hydrolysis uh, reaction and imagine that most of the hydroxide is being generated you know from the fast hydrolysis reaction and so based on that of course you know the K um, I think I have it here in the next slide you know the KB1 then is equals to the HG and the concentration of um, the, hydro uh, the hydroxide divided by you know the G2 minus and so forth and so in that case, you know, you've got the X squared divided by the formal concentration, which is a 0 0.05, you know, minus X is equals to the KB1, which is 5 times 10 to the power minus 5. And then you can solve for X. Again, you can make an assumption that 0 0.05 minus X is approximately the same as 0 0.05. And so that X can be neglected meaning you don't have to solve the quadratic equation meaning x is equals to the OH minus and, and is equals to the root of you know the KB1 which is that you know multiplied by the 0 0.05 and you can solve you know for x and when you do that you're gonna see x is equals to that and the negative log of that gives you the POH you know which is that and the pH is equals to 14, you know, minus, you know, uh, the pOH. And so you get uh, 11.230. So again, take note of that. If at all you've got a diprotic base, which is what I have here, you assume is a monoprotic base. And that's the way you solve for pH. So you neglect the second dissociation, um, the, uh, the second hydrolysis constant. So an another example here is assume I gave you an example as follows. You've got um, monohydrogen phthalate, KHP, and you have been asked to calculate the pH of 0 0.1 molar of KHP and compare it with 0 0.01 molar of KHP. The key thing is make sure you are able to recognize an ampiprotic species. You can see KHP is an ampiprotic species. So it's coming from the salt of thalic acid. You know, thalic acid looks like that. All right, that's thalic acid. You can see is a diprotic acid. You know, it dissociates, you know, to give you, this one is removed, and so the KA1, it gives you um, the phthalic acid, now the HP, remember this one is a H2P, and so this is the HP now, okay? And so what you're dealing with here is an ampiprotic species. And so because you're dealing with an ampiprotic species, you just need to remember the way to calculate, you know, the hydronium ion for an ampiprotic species is to use this equation here. And if you want, you can also use this relationship, which is a close approximation of that, where the pH is just equals to, you know, the average of the two pKa's, okay? And as you can see in my, maybe you can solve this you know try to get the hydronium ion when uh, you invoke those concentrations into my into my um, equation and do the same for the 0 0.01 okay and when you calculate both of them please solve this at home you're gonna see you know the ph in any of these is very similar to just 
taking an average of the PKA1 and the PKA2. So again, for ambiprotic species, they tend to be concentration independent. And that's why we are neglecting, you know, the concentrations in that case. Again, hopefully that's clear. Be able to recognize an ambiprotic species. Now, remember what we've done for the diprotic acids can be extended to triprotic acids, meaning you've got three hydrolyzable, you know, proteins. A good example, as I said, is histidine, is an amino acid, that is its structure. The PKA1 is due to hydrolysis, or rather, it's due to dissociation, you know, of that carboxylic acid group. The second dissociation is because of uh, the release of that proton due to that amide group and the last dissociation is because of the release of that proton from that um, ammonium ammonium group right there and you can see histidine is very related to histamine which is um, m most people tend to be quite allergic to histamine you know present in fish and so on doesn't smell very good you know sort of the rotting fish and so on produces a bit of histamine and you can see they are very very similar in terms of structure but i hope you can see the pka1 you know is 1.7 6.02 and the third one you know due to the release of that uh, amine is 9.08 okay and as I've done before, you know, there's a triprotic acid system, you know, there's a first hydrolysis, you know, the second hydrolysis, and the third, you know, hydrolysis. Similarly, it, pro it gives you, you know, a completely conjugate base, you know, this guy here, there's a first uh, uh, hydrolysis, and this is a second, you know, hydrolysis, and finally, that is a third hydrolysis okay so you can see if you combine these two equations or these two reactions you know you end up you know with uh, this relationship okay because you can see the h3a cancels out this one cancels out and so what you have is water giving you hydronium ion and the OH okay on the other hand, if you combine these two relationships, you can see you end up, you know, with this kind of relationship because again, you know, the H2A cancels out, this one cancels out, and so what you're gonna be left with is water giving you the hydronium ion and the hydroxide, and that way you've got the second relationship. And finally, if you pair these two relationships, these two reactions, you know, you end up, you know, cancelling out that, cancelling out that. And again, what you have is water giving you hydronium ion and the OH. And that way you've got, you know, this other relationship, you know, right there. So if I have given you just the KAs, you can certainly determine, you know, the KBs because of this relationship the ka1 multiplied by the kb3 is equals to the kw you know and so forth of course the kw is well known is equals to 10 to power minus 4 which i assume all of us you know know that constant <coughs> what you call the autoprotolysis constant of water so as we had done before with the diprotic acids, if I give you, say, histidine concentration of 0 0.05 molar, and then I ask you, you know, calculate, you know, the pH of that solution, simply treat it, you know, like a monoprotic acid. Hopefully that's clear. Treat it like a monoprotic acid, you know, eh? meaning that only one hydrolyzable proton is very effective, okay? All right, meaning the Ka1 is equals to x squared divided by the formal concentration minus x, and then you just solve x, and of course x is the hydronium ion concentration. If I give you the second or the first ampiprotic or intermediate species, take note of this relationship, you know, that the hydronium ion is equals to the Ka1, Ka2, and so forth. And it's very similar, you know, to saying pH is equals to the pKa1 plus pKa2 
divided by 2. Like I said, you know, they are concentration independent. On the other hand, if I give you the last intermediate species, take note of this, the concentration of the hydronium ion is a Ka2, Ka3, and that's a form of concentration and so forth, which again is very similar to saying pH is equals to the pKa2 um, plus a pKa3 divided by 2. Because again, Ampiprotic species, they are generally concentration independent. And so the pH you get here is very similar to the pH that you get there. And then finally, if at all you've got the fully deprotonated um, histidine, now you need to treat it, you know, as a monoprotic base. Because in this case now I've got the A3 minus, meaning the only thing that's predominant is reacting with water, you know, to give you, that's a KB1, giving you the, um, the HA2 minus plus the hydroxide, okay? And so whatever, uh, that's KB1 is equals to X squared, you know, divide by, divide, divide by um, F minus, um, X squared, are divided by um, F minus X and the X in this case remember guys is the hydroxide so you just need to calculate you know the pOH so again if it's fully deprotonated base treat it as a monoprotic acid to calculate the concentration of uh, the pOH So, so, so I hope that's fairly clear, and I think I've talked about this, you know, if at all it's um, H2 histidine, it's an ampiprotic species, the B, you know, you just use this relationship. You, you just use that relationship. And, you know, you're going to get, you know, the pH, um, if you use a concentration, you know, the pH is equal to 4.01, but if you assumed concentration independence and just average the pKa1 and pKa2 you can see what you get is 3.86 which is very similar really to the pH of 4 that you got if you used you know the concentration so you can see it's a close approximation you know they are close enough they're close enough on the other hand, if you use a second ambiprotic species, remember this relationship, the Ka2, Ka3, and then the histidine and so forth, and you get, you know, a pH of 7.60. Uh, if you neglected, you know, the 0 0.2 and so forth, you're going to find, you know, you can use this relationship, the pKa2 plus pKa3, and you get 7.55. You can see again, you know, they are very, very close. So if I were you, I wouldn't bother, you know, using the concentration. I would essentially use this relationship, just the average of the pKa's, you know, to give me the pH because they are close enough. So one other application, you know, of uh, polyprotic acids, you know, is the fact that, you know, you can use them to make buffers or diprotic buffers. I'll give you a quick example, you know, very, very similar to what we did before, you know, when we were doing monoprotic acid buffers. So assume I've got a relationship like this. I've got oxalic acid, and oxalic acid, you know, is a diprotic acid. And then I want to make a buffer, and I want to make a buffer um, of pH um, 4.5. So you can see I want to make a buffer, you know, of pH 4.5, you know, from taking oxalic acid and reacting it, you know, with uh, hydroxide, you know, so that I can make its conjugate um, base, uh, its conjugate basis, okay? So it's very important to determine which is the relevant equilibria because remember there are two equilibria because an oxalic acid it can undergo the first hydrolysis to give you you know the HA minus and then it goes you know hydrolysis further of these ampiprotic species you know to give you the fully deprotonated base with a pKa2 of 4.3. 
So the question is, which base pair, which RC base pair am I looking for to make a buffer, you know, of 4.50? Remember the rule of thumb is the following. For a buffer to be effective, the pH that is of interest should be within plus minus 1 of the pKa. And so because I'm looking for 4.5, as a pH of the buffer, it means the most relevant equilibria, you know, would be the second one because this pKa is within plus minus one of this P, uh, pH, of, of the, that pH. Meaning I need to titrate and add hydroxide to oxalic acid until the first equilibria goes to completion and then after that, I protonate, you know, and titrate the second reaction halfway. And that's what I have here, you know, so determine the relevant equilibria based on this relationship. And ideally, you know, the desired pH, you know, should be very close to the pKa. And of course, you can see the pH of interest is 4.5. And the pKa in this equilibria is 4.2, meaning this is the relationship that I'm looking for. So we need to fully react the first reaction, you know, and then after that, you know, react the second one halfway. So in this case, to react the first one, I need to add, I already know the oxalic acid. So I need to consume all the oxalic acid and convert it to the oxalate, okay? And, you know, I need to add the, 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 the number of moles of the oxalic acid is 0.024. I need to add the same number of moles of the base, you know, so that I can consume all this, and that's what I do. And then I can determine the volume of uh, the ass of the base, you know, that I added, you know, so that the base that I added in the number of moles, and then I divided by the concentration, and that gives me 50 mils of the base is what I needed to make this reaction go to completion. And then after that, you know, you need to react the second equilibrium expression by adding the base. So I starting with 0 0.024 that I formed. I add X number of moles of the OH. I don't know how much so that I can convert it to the conjugate base. And then finally, the equilibrium amounts would be, you know, what I started with minus X, what I consumed. All the base I added is consumed, and the conjugate base, you know, is what I formed, which is the X, and I can substitute it into my Henderson Hasselbach equation. The pH is known is what I'm looking for, 4.5. The pKa2 is the equilibrium expression that is taking place, plus the log of the base, which is X divided, you know, by the number of moles of the acid, and I can calculate what the X is in terms of the number of moles of the base that I added divided by the concentration and that gives me 20.44 mils and of course I have to take that and add it to what I had used initially to react with my first um, equilibrium expression meaning I need 70 mils you know of 0 0.5 molar concentration of the base you know to make a buffer you know of pH um, 4.5 and I hope it's fairly clear you know how we did that problem so like you guys at home you know very similar to the problem I've just talked about try to solve this problem so you've got malic acid again you can see it's a diprotic acid and then you've been required to make a pH a buffer of pH 5.2 from adding sodium hydroxide reacting it with malic acid to make malate you know which is a conjugate base so the question is how many how much volume you know of this base do you need to add to malic acid to make that buffer and again it's very similar to the problem that i've just solved you know so so that so solve that problem and it's fairly important also for your midterm as well 
So finally, you know, when you're doing titrations, you know, for diprotic acids, you know, you're going to see the titration curve is going to have two inflection points, okay? So it's going to look, you know, like that, you know, and like that because it's got two inflection points. Because in this case, this is pH and you're titrating it, you know, with a base, okay? If you're titrating, you know, a base, you know, with an acid, you know, you're titrating, um, uh, you're titrating a base, you know, with an acid, it's just going to be the opposite like that, meaning I've got two inflection points because I've got two hydrolyzable proteins. And I hope it's fairly clear. And that's all that I'm going to talk about, you know, with the acid-base equilibrium. Um, equilibrium.